I thought we'd spend the late afternoon with uh, a pair of Okanagan winemakers who I don't think they actually do much work late in the afternoon, so they were both available. Uh, Phil McGann joins us from Czech Checkmate Winery in the South Okanagan. Uh, Shane Munn joins us from Martin's Lane in the North Okanagan. Gentlemen, uh, welcome. How are you today? Good, thanks, Tony. Yeah, I'm great. Good to have you guys. I thought we, we don't have tons of time, but I wanted to talk about a few subjects with you. Uh, uh, the differences between your wineries, the things that are the same between your wineries. Uh, one is uh, Australian, one is not. Uh, they told me to say that, Shane. Uh, <laughs> but it's kind of fun to talk about uh, the differences between uh, Checkmate and Martin's Lane, because I think you both have the same goal of making uh, like super fine wine. Maybe Shane, you can kick it off. Yeah, I guess so. That's that's probably the main similarity, and uh, and also the fact we just focus on two varieties. So, yeah, focus is probably one of the key key attributes, and with that it comes you know an attention to detail to reflect where all of our each of our wines come from. And I think that's and Ma- yeah. And at Martin's Lane, the focus is obviously Pinot Noir and Riesling, or would you say Riesling and Pinot Noir? Uh, probably Pinot Noir in a slightly larger font than, than Riesling, but uh, yeah. it, yes, the production is skewed about uh, 75% Pinot, um, the rest Riesling. So, yeah. And Phil, you were really one of the first people to take on a Merlot in the South Okanagan and Chardonnay, even though you came from a Pinot background. Uh, so has it been easy for you to make that transition? Or? Uh, it's it's been an interesting journey, but um, I think the Chardonnay transition for me wasn't uh, happened a lot quicker than I anticipated it did. Uh, I think we, when I came in in 2013, I didn't really anticipate the, the quality that we had straight away, which uh, to me was very refreshing and really um, highlighted the faith that people have in the valley and the quality that you can produce here. Um, yeah. It was definitely an interesting uh, journey away from Pinot Noir. And uh, that 2013 harvest will always stay in my mind. And I hadn't, I've been making Pinot Noir for six years and hadn't tried any other varieties for that time. So I've just really, the tannin structures are so different, the, the time on skins, you know, all that sort of thing. And the, the cap management is completely different to what you do for Pinot Noir. So it was a lot of fun uh, to do that. And uh, yeah, so it's been a great journey. I, I know you both had a chance to come and see the place, but now that you're here, is the Okanagan uh, what you thought it was, or is it something completely different? Maybe Shane, we can start with you. Yeah, I'd say absolutely. It's a, it was, you know, it's a, it's a stunningly beautiful place. Um, it's rugged and and it's very dynamic. It's uh, it's not an easy place to make wine because you know we've got soils that are you know, the origin of, or the geological origin is volcanic and glacial and that can make wines that are pretty stern so i think kind of like phil said with building you know tannin structure can be quite different with pinots and so you know texture and the wine is sort of something that you almost have to use some deck techniques to, to build with both yeah uh, i'm going to try and fit these two wines in we're going to taste a, a chardonnay and a riesling uh, while we're talking but Let's just talk a little bit about you're both site focused and you both uh, make a big deal about the site. What is it, what is so important as a consumer? What what do we need to know uh, about the Chardonnay site or the Riesling site that makes, that, you know, helps us make sense of the wines? Maybe we'll start with the Chardonnay, Phil. Yeah, for me, the, the Chardonnay sites um, are really, what we want people to know is what the soil types are there, the, the type of aspect we have whether on the cooler western side we get like shadow effects in the afternoon um the orientation of the the grapes the type of material that was planted and whether or not it's on rootstock the age of the vines um i think the queen taken if if we're to try that it really does represent the site that it that it's from it's from old vines planted in 1975 Vines that are really quite historic in the valley. They're in some ways a mother block for a lot of vineyards. Um, the, the material, it's an unknown clone. It's a muscat clonal selection. But it's planted around the valley by different people as the Claver. The De Claver family were very generous in allowing people to take cuttings from this site. And mm-hmm. to actually have the, the mother block in that respect that we take the fruit from is really an honour in that regard. And uh, it really comes through in the wine. You get this beautiful... You get the, the muscat floral character, but you also get this smoking freshness vibrancy that comes from these um, 
rocky kind of gravel, you know, it, high content, but just good vibrancy coming from the sea. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because you, you well, you, you've come from Australia, but you came out of California. California was kind of the standard for New World Chardonnay back in the day, uh, but none of none of what we're doing tastes like that. It's it's a completely different ball game today, and I uh, I wonder, do you? I know it's a bit of a cliche, but do you try to take yourself out of the wine as much as possible and just let the uh, wine be what it is, or or do you feel like you need to be in there? No, I don't want to be in the wine too much. I think there's obviously a framework that the wine's housed in. But then with each one, I kind of let the wine go in its own direction. Uh, so the framework I place it in is, you know, very high quality French oak. All the single vineyard wines are uh, Burgundy Coopers, three-year, you know, French oak, tight grain. Some of the best uh, barrels that you can get. And, and it's really just allowing them to do their work, uh, but to harmonise with the wine, not to dominate the wine. So really the direction the wine goes is pretty much its own because it's natural ferments mostly. Um, yeah. My mind, it's the fermentation of barrel, the time on the gross leaves. And um, the only thing I really intervene with is really going to tank for a couple of months prior to bottling to allow the wine to tighten up. And that gives, sets it up for its life in the bottle, which is the most important place it's going to be. It's going to spend most of its life there. Yeah. So it's, instead of when you come out of barrel, the wine can be a little bit loose. It tightens back up in the tank. It's kind of, kind of hermetically sealed, and, and then going into the bottle, you just get this, this um, just a way that kind of helps the wine stay, uh, have a good life in the bottle. Yeah. Shane, it, and it's completely different for Riesling, or not? <laughs> uh, I'd probably echo Phil's uh, comments about you know soil is one of the kind of the main attributes that drives the uh, the personality of the wine. Um, you know, this is uh, this region through Fritzy's vineyard. It's on the west side of uh, of the lake, which is effectively the the warmer part of the lake. It's bases down to the east, not too far from the lake, so that kind of moderates the temperature. Um, mm -hmm. As Phil mentioned, these are older vines; they're about uh, 23 years old this year, and those old vines you know, drive concentration and persistence. This is probably our most aromatically restrained reasoning that we make, but um, but it's the one with the kind of probably most underlying power. But uh, yeah, I think it's kind of, you know, it's sort of, it's, it's more it's certainly a hands-off approach, you know, authenticity is kind of crucial to driving the style of our wines and, and the personalities they have, you know, the, you know, our, our, our vineyards and our wine winery is now certified organic. So almost mm -hmm. to be there's a moral obligation to kind of do nothing and let the wines reflect where they're from, but you know, yeah. by guidance. But um, but uh, yeah, it's sort of I think doing as little as possible in terms of input is uh, is what gives them their personality. Well, the one thing that strikes me about BC Riesling is nobody ever talks about it internationally or outside of us yet, uh, and yet. When you taste them with the other benchmarks, I, I feel like we're we're gaining ground quickly. Do you, do you feel like that, or? Yeah, I, I certainly think so. I'd say it's it's probably it, I would probably put it near the top uh, if we look at you know our peers in the valley is is one of BC's strongest varieties and how it could um, uh, stand alongside international benchmarks from other regions and that sort of yeah. stuff. It's got great acidity, uh, great personality. Um, the, the the rocky soil to give the wine that kind of sternness that Riesling geeks love and that sort of stuff and uh, uh, but it's not tricky to grow here you know sometimes there's too much acidity so texture is one of those things that like Pinot you have to use technique in our case mm -hmm. that's in contact and fermentation and large oak that gives the wine some real really interesting complexity. So if I move over to, I'll stay with Martin's Lane and move over to the Pinot Noir. Maybe it's sometimes odd for people to think that anybody actually would make Pinot Noir and Riesling at the same winery, but it doesn't really work like that at Martin's Lane. It's more about the separate sites. And yeah, really yeah. It's brought in. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of varieties that do wonderfully in BC and in the Okanagan in particular. And, uh, you know, if we look at our harvest, generally we start and finish uh, – um, harvest every year with Riesling, with Pinot generally in the middle. So it sort of shows that in terms of like harvest dates and that sort of stuff, they're, they're well suited. You know, we could quite easily have focused on Pinot and Chardonnay as is the Norman Burgundy, but, um, you know, so 
from that perspective, we're sort of breaking the rule a bit. But. I know that we're going to have our own style, but you know, you came out of New Zealand. Uh, obviously, you're tasting all the wines in Oregon, California, Burgundy. Uh, we have a different style again, I think, than any of them, but we still have true Pinot now, and I think that's what's most interesting about the early Pinot life in BC. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, I mean, we make, uh, if we look at the last vintage, we make five Pinots in one vintage, and they're dramatically different. And so there is no, uh, there is no real, I guess, BC style in our wines, but they, you know, they're made pretty hands off, and so they reflect their sights and their little sub appellations with quite mm -hmm. distinctively different um, characteristics. You know, there's probably a signature of our style of wines, which are they're quite bold, concentrated, fruit rich wines. Um, but tannin structures are different in all of them. You know, we use certain techniques like uh, fermentation in concrete vessels and a decent percentage of whole bunch in the, in the fermentation to to give those sort of to build texture. And so. Yeah. It, and it all goes towards the goal of kind of making, bringing elegance into the wines. Uh, what about this term cool climate? Because, uh, so Phil, when we t turn to your Merlot, like is, are you in a cool climate for Chardonnay or Merlot or is Sheen in the cool climate up north? I, I'm not sure if that term is useful anymore when we talk about wines in the Okanagan. Yeah, it's, um, it's a tricky one, especially when you talk to people in Canada, there's a concern, uh, a belief that the South Okanagan is a, is a warm climate, mm -hmm. but uh, it's warm in a relative sense to, to BC and to Canada, but I don't regard it as a warm climate in the world scheme of things. If you think about our winter, it's very harsh down here. We have some of the coldest temperatures in, in, uh, in the Okanagan down here. We get down to minus 20. We have these very cold shoulder seasons. Um, the spring, you know, the early spring is very cold. The, the fall tends to get cold from the start of October, the season's very short in that respect. And people refer to these heat spikes that we have, but they're really necessary for the region to be viable. Um, and especially to grow varieties like Bordeaux, uh, Bordeaux varieties like Merlot, sorry. So um, I think of the heat not as uh, making it a hot climate, but as a, a necessary part of this region being a viable uh, region on the cooler spectrum, um, if that makes sense. That's all I can. Yeah, I think we, yeah, I'd echo with what Bill says. I mean, really, our, where both our wineries are situated is almost like we deserve to be two different regions, the north and the south. They're dramatically different in terms of peaks and diurnal swings and that sort of stuff. But, uh, you know, we have the, uh, we have the attributes to be a cool climate. You know, we, uh, we can ripen Pinot Noir. Easily, but not too easily. Um, keep the elegance and the freshness in the wines. Um, you know, this is easily the most difficult place I've ever made wine, and that's because of the the dynamic range in um, harvest that we've had. You know, if we go from 2015, which was a great warm harvest, um, but challenging from a Pinot point of view because it had it gave us the heat that we don't necessarily need for to ripen Pinot and Riesling. Right. We went forward uh, four years to 2000. And 19, which uh, like our Pinots are between 12 and a half and 13 percent alcohol, and from that year, so to barely, you know, have it barely ripe, but still with the same degree of elegance. So, but it's uh, it, it certainly is a challenge, but it's a fun challenge. You're both foreigners working here now for some time. Uh, what, what what would you tell people around the world about Canadian wine, perhaps from an Australian perspective or a Kiwi perspective that that they don't know. We're not. We're not a. We're, we're Anzacs, Tony. We're Anzacs. Okay. <laughs> we're Anzacs. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's a uh, very different. I, I think my most recent experience is California, so I always kind of tend to refer to that. I've been outside Australia for some time now, but I think the wines here are very different. Um, they have their. They have a, a restraint and an elegance to them, um, which I think. Uh, especially like in Chardonnay, tends not to be the case as much. Um, and I think that's really due to the purity of the fruit that we get here. The, the short season that we have, because we are a cool region, our season's only four, four and a half months. Um, very dry most of the time in the, in the season. So we don't have 
uh, a lot of disease pressure that, you know, say down in the Russian River and the, with the marine layer coming in that you tend to get just when the humidity coming in. Um, and I think that elegance also transfers through to the Merlots as well. They, because we're actually, in some ways we are kind of pushing the boundaries with uh, Bordeaux varieties here, because we're not that far inside the climatic envelope for these varieties. So there's a lot of natural acidity in the fruit, even when it is ripe for flavors and ripe for tannins, there's still this acidity that uh, is actually hidden away inside the berries there, that comes out during fermentation. You get this freshness and vibrancy coming through. So I think both from a California and Australian perspective, I think there's, a, there's an elegance to the wines here. And Shane, what, what do you think about that? What other people, What's the vision of, or what, what do people think about the Okanagan outside of us, or what should they be thinking about? Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, you've got to be able to, I mean, I think we both our projects show that, um, you know, with multiple sub regional sort of wines and wines of the different vineyards that have really different personalities, it shows that we can really make world class wines. And that's the thing I'm trying to show people is, you know, when we have interns here from Australia or New Zealand, you know, they, mm. they on with a, a bunch of our wines, and it's uh, it's quite rewarding. You know, like just the other day, I got uh, got a text from an Australian intern that had sort of drunk one of our wines at a at a post harvest party in Tasmania alongside some great wines, and and you know the feedback was great. And so, like, it's getting the wines out there. You know, we had our yeah. uh, Rieslings, this Riesling served alongside a uh, uh, a Clemens Bush Riesling from uh, from the Mosel, which one of the greatest reefing producers in the world, and uh, and it looked pretty good. And um, you know, look, uh, you know, we're still surprising people. Um, it takes time to convince people, but you know, um, but you know, we don't have time, so we're uh, so we're uh, we're working quickly and fast. And uh, but you know, I think Phil and I have both been here for almost half a dozen years each now, and uh, you know, I think kind of hanging around shows that we're serious about what we're doing. And that's sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, go ahead, Phil. I was just gonna say, I think it still comes down to education about mm -hmm. the valley that, uh, and seeing and tasting is believing, you know, it's mm -hmm. almost like, um, and I found that especially with our wines, that once people taste them, they, they tend to believe. So uh, I think that's the thing that once people try these wines, uh, they do compete on a world stage. Uh, both Shane's and uh, I think as well as ours. So it's really just that exposure to them, I guess. Well, you both have uh, great facilities. You seem to have most of the tools uh, that you need to make the wine, which is kind of nice. But I think the you know the the last piece of the puzzle, of course, is where they come from now in the Okanagan and how we farm that. And uh, we're learning so much, I think, all the time about farming. Uh, even the clones, even the varieties, it, it takes time for, for all of this to come together. Uh, Phil, you, did, did you not make Pinot Noir though? Have you been chatting at all to Shane about what he should be doing with this Pinot Noir? Well, Shane's, Shane's a very, a bit defensive when I give him tips, you know, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> well, of, we could talk. Fine, so it's just uh, kind of how it goes. But uh, no, Shane's very independent and uh, uh, pretty much he's his own man. So. I knew coming here that I was kind of leaving Pinot Noir behind to some extent, that Chardonnay mm -hmm. would be my main focus. So I'm quite content. I've really enjoyed making the Merlots. So um, I think that's good. So yeah, no, Shane's definitely his own man up there. So yeah. Everybody, uh, we're almost out of time, guys. Everybody's eyeing uh, the, the super north of the Okanagan, the far north. Is that of interest uh, to you, Shane, and for other sources of grapes? or uh, Progressively. To, to have up the Vernon Way and... Uh, yeah, we're, I mean, we, that's where we, I guess that's probably the, the new things for us is diversifying where our vineyards are. You know, we have the four vineyards we farm uh, all pretty uh, close to each other in North Okanagan, but last spring we planted uh, a new high density vineyard up in Lake Country um, and another one uh, slightly further east in South, South mm -hmm. Colonia. Um, so we are pushing the boundaries a little bit. Um, but yeah, who's to say we, we might end up in Vernon or around there? Is uh, I mean, this valley is is pretty narrow and pretty deep, and so there's only so far east or west we can go before we get up too high. But we are we're certainly pushing the, the limits in, in terms of elevation and uh, and latitude to a degree. 
And Phil, you're wrapping up. Uh, we know that you're still finishing the renovation uh, of Checkmate. Uh, we look forward to getting in there. Will we see it sometime soon, or will it be next year now, or how do we know when it will? Um, I, I, I think uh, it could be towards the end of this year or, or early next year, I think, uh, yeah. the quality of, of the scheme of things. Um, you know, looking back, I often wonder why we needed to upgrade the facility anyway. You know how beautiful it was, Tony. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's quite stunning now. It's um, it's really starting to take shape. There's still obviously a lot of fit out to do, but the the, the exterior is pretty much done. The landscaping's uh, beginning, um, and it's really just the final fit out of the tasting of, of the hospitality area. Um, yeah, there's still a bit well, of. I know that many of your followers will uh, have had a chance to taste the wines in that famous glass house that was on the property, yeah. uh, which now has another use, apparently. Uh, Shane was telling me that he's growing tomatoes in it. So. <laughs> no, he's, 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 uh, it's actually going to be for the chickens. <laughs> so everyone can see the chickens as they go by. So yeah, uh, I'm sure Shane's got designs on it. Yeah. <laughs> Shane is, you have more room than anybody up in that winery. You, you don't need any extra uh, equipment, I think. No, we, uh, I mean, we're growing slowly, but, you know, the focus here is on making great wine rather than lots of it. And, uh, you know, um, we've had six harvests in the building here. And uh, what that's given us, you know, every parcel is kept separate the whole way through the winemaking process right to the, the final stage of elevage and that gives you an immense amount of ability to learn about each parcel each block within vineyards and yeah that's kind of where the focus is and you know that's that's where the future will lie it's not you know, there'll be single block wines within time we've already have a few in bottle and that sort of thing and it's it's exciting to kind of see different personalities and uh and qualities come through from from different sites uh well, guys, it was great to catch up with you today, as ever brief as it was, and we'll uh, we'll get some information out, of course, to people following uh, this video about your wines, where they can uh, have a look at them online and uh, purchase and do all the rest of those good things. But uh, good luck with 2020. It's a fun kickoff to a season in a strange time, but uh, it, might, it could be a, a Haley's Comet, but who knows? <laughs> It should be. Well, it's a good start to the vintage so far, so we'll see how it, how it pans out. I think the vines have been a bit oblivious to the craziness going on around us. But they, yeah. Pretty good so far. That's probably the best. Thanks so much. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Phil McGann and uh, Shane Munn, uh, two gentlemen making wine in the Okanagan Valley and uh, uh, setting a new path for winemaking as well. Thanks for joining us on Gizmani on Wine. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Andrew.